At a time when a shortage of skilled workers has become a major issue in the hospitality industry, one company have taken a novel and humanitarian approach to solving the problem. Here to tell us more is Greg Frutinik from Syrah Hospitality. Greg, welcome to the show. How are you? Great, thank you. Thanks so much for having me. A bit warm, to be honest. London, for all the listeners out there, if you listen when you listen to this, it's, it's been 30 degrees in London for the past few days, but we're not complaining. We like we like the heat. No, I think I am complaining. I just I barely slept a wink last night. It was so hot. It was like trying to sleep inside a massive furnace. Horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always thankful for any for any heat we get, but I know what you mean it is uh well you're up north though, aren't you? So maybe it's slightly cooler. I don't either way. It's summer's come well, up this year. Looking at weather next week, it's grim up north, as they say. So, yeah, but um, listen, thank, thanks so much for, for coming on the show. Um, for people that don't know, and I, I didn't know about Syrah Hospitality, just summarise what you guys do and what makes you so different to other hospitality companies. So Syrah Hospitality, we're a non-profit organisation that essentially creates hospitality schools around the world. So our core purpose of existence is to support new careers for individuals that otherwise would have been overlooked by the hospitality industry. So people um, within within our demographic include refugees, people who have had a lived experience of homelessness, people generally who are unemployed and underemployed. We, we don't specify too sharply into one specific demographic. We're trying to help as many people as we can to see the light and, and cross over into the hospitality industry, which we all know is uh, has been suffering for a long time in terms of the talent shortage. So um, we do this work all over the world. We actually started over in Mexico, um, working with a, with a newly opening property. Um, and then over the years, you know, typically our old model was to partner with a, like I say, a, a hotel at the point of opening around six months before they open their doors to help support their you know their kind of entry level headcount of course but also to help them build community diplomacy in, in those destinations and kind of do what many hotels don't do honestly you know when these new hotel hotels are opening around the world typically you know the first thing they'll do is, is kind of literally build a wall around their their kind of uh, property and, and people especially local communities that wouldn't have the opportunity to stay or dine at that hotel start to feel this this kind of rift forming between the real community, which is where this hotel is based, and the, the guests and, and the teams that are working within that hotel. So we would start working with hotels about six months before they opened, help them find local individuals who were in need of this opportunity. Uh, we then screen them about four times before we accept them onto our training program. Um, and then we train those individuals in all of the skills that we believe aren't being taught in entry level kind of hospitality training. So skills which include emotional intelligence, leadership, communication skills, how to build your own brand. So how to, when you enter the workforce, how to remain authentic to your own personality while still fitting within the framework of the hotel that you're going to begin working in. Um, so we were, we were doing this kind of global model with newly opening hotels for about eight years. And then two years ago, we launched in London for the first time. So we, we transitioned from these more rural destinations to cities where, as we know, um, you know, COVID and, and Brexit, especially in London, has had such a huge impact that we wanted to bring that impact that we'd been having uh, and, and bring that to, to, to London and then to, you know, more cities around the world moving forward. And what's the response been like since you brought this to London in terms of, clients and also the uptake to the courses that you run it's been it's been really successful in terms of the hotel support that we've had um i think you know if if you turn back the clock two or three years would luxury lifestyle properties be open to hiring individuals that have come from the backgrounds that i just discussed maybe not so much um not to say that hotels don't already have that kind of philanthropic gene but i think you know over the past two or three years everything is pointing towards a brighter future and i think hotels really want to adopt new ways of working and new ways of finding people but maybe they just didn't have the way to do that or, or a method to do that so yeah i mean it's, it's been fantastic in london we've to reel off a few names we've worked with 
some of the most loved hotel brands, brands that I personally, you know, adore and always have done working in the industry. So everyone from Hoxton to Citizen M, bigger brands like Hilton and Accor, um, and then some smaller, more kind of boutique operators as well. And really that, you know, the, the, the strength of our hotel partners then answers the the following question you had about you know, finding the talent. That was that was much more of a jigsaw puzzle for me to figure out when we brought the the, the impact or the, the program to London because it was really trying to build strong partnerships with other charities and other nonprofits that could refer their talent through to Syro Hospitality. So we're very partnership driven. A lot of the talent that we we find and those are our students come from amazing other kind of charities that still have the same ethos as us so trying to uplift lives trying to support you know kind of break that skills gap and, and most importantly get people into meaningful work and I was, I was saying to you earlier that this um, this show couldn't have been filmed at a more apt time because i was volunteering just this week on um, tuesday at an event in rotherham recovery near to where i live and um I was asked to host a public living room there for a safe space for um, people that were watching the documentaries about recovery um, to come and have a chat and decompress a little bit. Um, And some of the stories I heard while watching the presentations about addiction, about homelessness, um, and it just got me thinking related to what we've said about how work fits into that jigsaw, because it does give, well, first of all, it gives money, but it gives a sense of self-worth a sense of motivation, a, a value to someone's life. So I think what you guys are doing is absolutely fantastic. Whereabouts did the idea originate from? So the idea originated with our founder and CEO, a lady called Harsha, who was working in luxury hospitality for, for a long time, um, but always had a very kind of philanthropic gene, um, which actually stems from her family. So her her father uh, owns a charity out in India, which helps treat curable blindness. And um, when Harsha was growing up, she would spend lots of time with kind of probably one of the most charitable figures when you think of uh, when you think of charity, and that's Mother Teresa, who was very close with her father. So she grew up with this kind of yeah philanthropic energy, altruistic energy around her. Moved into luxury hospitality and and, and didn't really follow that for a, for a little while. And then the idea came from she was traveling herself for work and she was in Cambodia and she came across a, another local charity there that was essentially helping finding individuals who had been kind of indoctrinated into the sex trafficking industry and helping tra- train those females typically to become housekeepers for local residences, so private ho- private homes. And, you know, she was working for a kind of high-end luxury hotel group at the time, and she knew that there was a massive issue with staffing, you know, finding the right teams. And she thought, well, you know, if if this works out in Cambodia, then surely the luxury hospitality industry can can adopt something like that. So she was very inspired. Um, She then, I think she literally saw how how her kind of, you know, family philanthropic uh, gene and her current work life could be threaded together. Uh, So she kind of quit her job um, and then went over to New York to study at Cornell University with this idea always in her mind. So, you know, connecting hotels with local communities. Um, And then she won the business prize at Cornell University and she got a very small grant to start her own business, which was Syrah Hospitality. And then, yeah, it's gone from strength to strength after that. Indeed, it certainly looks like it's been well received. I mean, some of the, the names of the brands that you mentioned earlier, big brands, big important brands and, and recognizable names in the hospitality world. How important is it for, for these companies to be, yes, actually doing what they're doing and partnering with you, but to be seen to be helping and to be seen to be a power for for, for the greater good? I think it's the one of the most important things that most brands and most businesses should be doing. Um, like I say, I think, there's been a real kind of sea change since since I moved to London eight years ago um, in how hospitality and local hotels want to be giving back. And I think, yes, there's there's some element of, you know, 
DEI, ESG, CSR. There's all of these kind of buzzwords, which some people call them buzzwords. Obviously, we believe that they're not. We believe they're very important. Um, there's a mounting pressure from every everyone, you know, from your guests. Uh, I think your guests expect you to be giving back in some way these days. Yeah. The press, uh, of course, you know, and then internal and external st- stakeholders, investors, you know, everything like that. People want to be aff- affiliated and associated with a brand that does good. And I think there's, you know, there are still a lot of brands out there, not just in hospitality, but in, you know, every other industry who may talk a big talk about their kind of, you know, sustainability and things like that, but actually maybe aren't doing something that actions that meaningfully. And I think, you know, something harsher our CEO has taught me over the years is that, you know, we are a nonprofit organization, but actually the most important thing I think for charities and nonprofit organizations is to be relevant uh, and to actually, you know, also help improve businesses at the same time. And I think, you know, I'm very thankful to be working with Syro in a in a position where actually we do both. So we allow those operators to really give back meaningfully, but then we also help them improve their business operations. Which, like I say, if you can if you can tackle those two problems, I think you're in a pretty good position. I'm 100 percent with you. You mentioned big brands like um, Hilton and Accor, and I tend to think that processes that they um, enroll to drip feed down through the industry so it's it's so important for those at the the top of the tree the biggest hospitality brands in the world um and then everyone else kind of follows suit you mentioned some um really cool lifestyle living brands like um eden that i know fairly well that um things like that are so important for them um but how about you tell us how you ended up have you always been a, a a guy that's had an interest and a love for for charity did you fall into this or what what's your history so yeah, my I mean, from the very start, it's been hospitality for me, and then I kind of deviated away from that. So, first job at the tender age of fourteen years old, which I don't think is legal, but I was born in the Lake District, so I think you know you can get away with most things up there. Um, I was working in a local cafe, which you know sounds relatively um, you know not, not not that important, but I actually think for a young man at the age of fourteen to to have the opportunity to interact with people outside of your friends, family, school teachers and things like that at such a young age, I do think that's really formative, even at 14. I think, you know, service and, you know, being approachable with guests and things like that is is a really great way to grow your own confidence and skills. Um, So, yeah, I was working in the cafe and then ended up going to, you know, working all kinds of weird and wonderful hospitality businesses after that. Worked at a caravan park in the Lake District, which was You've got some funny stories about that uh, and then moved into hotels eventually um, but was studying at the same time so I'd, I'd studied journalism at uni and then went off the, the plan was always to be a travel writer because I had a travel bug from my father who was did a lot of kind of moving around the world when he was younger um, and then didn't end up becoming a writer for in the travel industry but started running a, a kind of brand partnerships for a luxury travel company so similar to our CEO actually kind of that luxury lifestyle um, experience was was quite a big part in my life and I did always think that there was something missing in, in a lot of those luxury lifestyle brands in terms of giving back um, and then funnily enough at the same time that I was doing that my sister started working in Brixton prison uh, down in London and the stories that she came home with or that we spoke about on the phone is kind of the fact that so many of the inmates there, uh, you know, had such skills and had such personalities. And obviously that's, you know, that that's kind of a given, but I think a lot of the time people think that, you know, prisons are for punishment rather than, you know, reformation. And, and mm-hmm. actually she taught me a lot about the work that she was doing in there. So I started, volunteering for a charity that was helping mentor young offenders essentially so kind of young men who were at risk of going to prison or were just coming out of prison and I think it's it's so enriching to spend time with individuals who've come from such a different background and I think that sparked something in me to want to really give back in a more meaningful way um and then so my my first opportunity to do that really was when COVID came around and uh I found myself you know jobless as many people did uh, i was working in travel so it wasn't a great 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 job to hold on to um 
and yeah, during COVID, myself and, and a couple of friends came up with a concept to help reward NHS workers for all of their amazing work during the pandemic. So we set up a, a non-profit organization called Nights on Us, um, which essentially was offering a bit of a light at the end of the tunnel for for people on the front line in the NHS by giving them giving away free hotel stays. So kind of luxury lifestyle hospitality. I, I, I again knew that that was a such an amazing way to say thank you to enrich lives. And so yeah, we set up an initiative and yeah, gathered gathered uh, some of the best hotels up and down the UK who were all donating free rooms to NHS workers. Um, and that was extremely rewarding. It signaled to me that hospitality as an industry is amazing at giving back. You know, they do have the gene of service is all about empathy and all about caring. So, and that's what hospitality is built upon. So it came very became very clear to me at that point that actually, you know, if I were to continue working in nonprofits and charities, something in the hospitality industry would make the most sense. Um, and then I very serendipitously came across um, Harsha and, and, and Syrah Hospitality via a friend who kind of told me about her on a bit of a bit of a night out. Actually, um, she was saying that she knew this person that ran a non-profit, non-profit organization, and I, we, yeah, we maybe foolishly decided to call her at two in the morning to, to have a conversation. She was based on the she was based in in in, uh, in the US, so it wasn't as outrageous. But she didn't pick up That's the phone excuse. that night, which I'm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> she didn't pick up that evening, which I'm still very thankful for. Um, but then the next day we had a phone call and she told me about Sarah's work and I was just blown away by her energy, her passion and obviously the work that she was doing. So we, um, yeah, came on board. Um, it was actually two years ago, pretty much to the day, um, started working with Sarah. And essentially my role was to take all of the work that Harsha had been doing in these far flung kind of, you know, amazing destinations like the Caribbean, Mexico and Namibia and to kind of tweak that model and make it more relevant to, to London. So yeah, kind of, uh, Harsha had been doing all the work in Caribbean and Mexico and then I started in Hackney. So, uh, not quite the same location, but. Hey, them's the breaks. <laughs> <laughs> tell us about, tell us about some of the success stories then. Yeah, so there are so many to, to choose from. Um, and, it, you know, kind of brings a smile to my face whenever I do think about anyone that's been successful through our programme, especially in London, mm-hmm. because, you know, in London we are working with a... It, it's, it's a it's a tricky market in London. You know, there are, there's a lot of pressure being put on people to find employment from the job centres. And, you know, I think it, it's not always the interest isn't always in finding the right work for people. It's it, it, the statistics are, let's just get people into work. And I think yeah, there's a reason why retention is so low. And I think, you know, you need to try and find something that people are passionate about. And, you know, in London, that's very much a big part of our job is kind of creating PR campaign for hospitality and for hotels, because we all know it's, you know, it's a challenging environment to work in if you're not ready to, you know, put in the work like 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 most things. So, um, I mean, yeah, we we just we just graduated our fourth program in London uh, about a month ago, and there was some incredible success success stories through that. Um, one in particular was a was a was a kind of one of our students who was very unfortunately kind of became homeless midway through the program, um, and you know, bless his heart, didn't. didn't really tell us straight away so he'd actually been sleeping on the night bus um just wow. in order to have a kind of roof over his head or a very kind of I use the word roof there kind of obviously very loosely um but we're still coming to the class every morning at 11 o'clock um still completely mm. committed and, and this is an individual who has we we talk a lot about the hospitality gene uh, and that's the the gene of empathy and the gene of service. And, and this particular individual had that, you know, through and through. Mm. But just and, and and really was very unfortunate. I won't go too far into the situation, but he, yeah, dealt a few kind of very unlucky hands during the program, and essentially was you know ended up in this situation. So eventually, we kind of came to understand that he was sleeping on the night bus. Um, 
and then it was it was it was really challenging for us actually because we typically if someone is at risk of becoming homeless we wouldn't accept them onto the program because it's not our role and it's not our responsibility to to do that work mm. we're we're not really set up to do that you know we're a hospitality training provider so typically what we would always say to someone who may be at risk of that is you know first of all they need to get their kind of pillars you know their kind of life pillars in in balance because even coming to training let alone getting a job when you have those kind of background you know that background noise going on is very difficult but like i say this individual at the start of the program or when when he he enrolls he wasn't in that position but a few kind of negative things happened to him um and it shone a light massively on the system in london for getting people in temp- into temporary accommodation for us because you know homelessness is at its highest it's ever been in london at the moment and that was really apparent we we just couldn't find him anywhere to stay we we called and met with so many shelters and you know because the need is so high at the moment really they're prioritizing different kind of demographics for that so it was completely inspiring um to not that part but we managed to find him um somewhere to stay in one of our hotel partners who basically offered up a you know free room for him which was again the gene of service the gene of, mm. of hospitality and empathy was really shining strongly there um and so this individual graduated the program uh and has since um gained full-time employment uh, at a company that he absolutely loves um i actually was speaking to him on linkedin this morning just chatting away to him and seeing how he was doing and he's such an inspiration of resilience and the kind of people that we really look to support because they, you know, they, they need the opportunity, but they also want the opportunity and they're perfect fit for the hospitality industry. So mm. yeah, that was a, that was a really amazing, um, really amazing story that just came out of the past program. I'm looking forward to more. I'm looking forward to the first Cyrus CEO. I'll do a show on it. In fact, from, from Cyrus to CEO, <laughs> give me the first rise to it. <laughs> it's going to happen. It's going to happen. <laughs> What's what are the plans for Syra in the future, Greg? So we we essentially now have these two models where we're still working with new openings. So we're still partnering with those hotels that really need to build meaningful connections before they open their doors to guests. Um, but the success in London and, and the work that we've been doing in London has also shown us that you know it's time to expand into into more cities, um, which takes you know a lot of work it's it's very it's very people heavy as you can imagine it's not like a software as a service business where we can you know just deploy in different markets at the click Mm -hmm. of a finger um not to take anything away from those businesses or or to say that it's easy for them but so we've just recently actually this last school that we that we ran the one that i was just speaking about that was in partnership with a with a technology company called Muse, um, who were essentially a first and foremost, they were a property management system, and now they're kind yeah. of you know reaching out into all different types of, of kind of technology space. They have been really kind of integral for us to understand our worth within that space. Um, you know, because for Muse, they work with thousands of customers or hotels around the world who are really in need of you know, their software and their technology because it's fantastic and very kind of innovative. But they're also in need of finding new individuals to actually work and use this technology and software. So as part of this arrangement and kind of uh, partnership that we have with Muse, we, we're going to be launching four more schools around the world in partnership with them, which is really That's exciting. Awesome. So we're, yeah, and it's, again, credit to the team there, everyone from you know, the founder and the CEO who we're close with to the marketing team and, and the customer team, they're all genuinely care. It's not just we'll put, you know, a big marketing campaign behind this because we want to get more customers. They genuinely yeah. care and it's so clear. So big partnerships like that are really a focus for me. So finding those those businesses that potentially, you know, have more uh, to invest in something like Syrah Hospitality, Um and then we're also, so we're working a lot on that with some new destinations with Muse. Um, we have a few more global pop-ups in the pipeline for next year, which we're not quite ready to confirm. Um, and then finally, the big thing that we're also working on next year is we're launching a kind of a new model in London to help 
support hotels. So typically in the past in London, the way that it would work is that we would have a group of hotels would sponsor one specific school. So they would kind of crowdsource the money between them all and then they would invest in the school itself to have the opportunity to hire from the from the graduation. Um which is which has worked, you know, well, but actually it doesn't offer a huge amount of flexibility to our hotel partners because they have pressure to hire from that one particular school. So mm. what we're doing and launching in January is we're launching more of a subscription model for hotels. So rather than just investing in the one school, they can invest in a number of schools throughout the year and essentially yeah. have the opportunity to not pick and choose because it's a bit more complex than that. I, I wish it was so simple, but to have multiple hiring opportunities in multiple yeah. across multiple times. So it means that there's a higher level of flexibility for our hotel partners. It also means that there's a higher level of choice for our students as well, because we'll be working with 14 different operators per, per year. Um, so that's really, really exciting. And we're kind of onboarding partners at the moment for that. Um, so yeah, the, the future is really bright. And I think it's, again, we're, we're so partnership driven that the more businesses and, and, and kind of brands that we can speak to who share our ethos of giving back and mm. uplifting people, the, the wider our net spreads and the more interesting kind of individuals we meet. And I, I'd say that's the most exciting thing about my role in kind of terms of helping develop what we're doing is you do just meet some unbelievable people, you know, from from inspiring individuals inside the hotels to other charities that we work with. And then obviously, most importantly, in some ways, the actual students themselves, because they are so much fun to spend time with, you know, and actually seeing their journey throughout the school. First of all, they they come in quite quite shy, quite kind of non-committal almost, because it's a very new industry for them. It's a very new experience. And then you you run through to the graduation ceremony and I can share a couple of videos if you like after this with you about the graduation ceremony last time. But we, you know, we had we had a live band there and you know about halfway through the program we had two or three of the students get up to the microphone and they started doing their own karaoke and like that would have never happened <laughs> would have never happened on, on day one, one. <laughs> exactly they've, they've i think the important thing for us is that we you know we're connecting hotels to communities but we're also mm. trying to build a little community ourselves within each school that we create so that people feel empowered and confident to have the opportunity to move into employment and i think yeah that that kind of community building is um gets me out of bed every day yeah fantastic so i mean it, it certainly got me thinking and i'm sure there, there are ways that we can partner together edwards and finn um and you guys so um how can anyone else get in touch with you is linkedin the best channel to to get in touch with you linkedin's good yeah i'm always i'm always i'm always on linkedin i find it's just so much easier isn't it just to have a few chats on linkedin I like the I like yeah. the immediacy of it, uh, but obviously we're we're on Instagram at Syrah Hospitality. Um, we're not on TikTok, maybe one day. I don't know how it works yet. So, uh, and I'm I'm of the age that should know how it works. So that's a bit embarrassing. Uh, but yeah, LinkedIn would be great. Um, Instagram brilliant as well, and obviously I'm on email. Uh, but yeah, I'd say LinkedIn's a really good way if you wanted to connect with me to discuss how you can partner anyone out there or support local communities in london or further afield always very open to have a conversation with people that care so um yeah i'll be around for a chat for sure greg thank you so much for coming on the show and the seriously place. i think it's, it's to for people to learn what you guys do what you guys stand for and it's such a critical time for you to be operated as well isn't it there's so much homelessness you've got brexit we're coming out of covid there's so many shortages in the in the hospitality sector in terms of staff. Um, it's really the perfect storm for you guys to be one of the organisations that plugs that gap, isn't it? Yeah, it's you know we, we're uh, obviously if we could turn back time, we wouldn't have Brexit and COVID happen, uh, but we like to see it as an opportunity for people to rethink what they've done for a long time. And I think that's needed. You know, hospitality is such an old yeah. industry that sometimes it can be like steering a, a bit of a tanker. Um, and like I say, not saying that Brexit and COVID were positive things in, in any respect, but if you can try and find the silver linings in those kind of huge world events, then, you know, I think it, it needs to be done. So, yeah, we're in a position where, you know, we're, we're, we're so happy to be able to help both the operators and the students. And, and yeah, 
there'll be more to come, which is exciting. Good. I think what you're doing is commendable. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, that's all we've got time for this week. Uh, like and share the show because it helps us attract fantastic guests like Greg. And we'll see you again next week.